Yeah. That includes, in the spring, uh, the McGall Lectureship, and every, every March, you might imagine, uh, in future years, Lord willing, that we will continue to have these lectureships, uh, another great opportunity to come and hear uh, some, some fascinating speakers uh, from many walks of life, many, many different specialties. But tonight, uh, to, to cap off our lesson, I thought it would be very fitting to end on this high note. Uh, a child has been born to us. Iconic words, right? Coming to us from... Uh, the, the text of the prophet Isaiah, words that readily resonate within Christian communities because we tie them so easily to our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And yet, like last week, I, I, I do want to tie them with Christ, the one who, who fulfills our own messianic expectations. But I also want to talk about how these verses functioned within their original setting and, and what they would have meant to that first audience uh, before Jesus himself came on the scene. This will be somewhat similar to our talk last week where we discussed those famous passages that come to us from Isaiah 7 and 8. Uh, most famous among them is that passage about Emmanuel and yes, there too we, we connect it so readily to Christ and yet they had a function within their own time period that was rather different than how we often look at those passages. So. I've titled, I've subtitled tonight's lesson, Expectations of a Better Messiah. Now what you might see hinted at there in the implication is that we're talking about a multiplicity of messiahs. I'm just curious, how many of you, is that a new concept, the idea of multiple messiahs? Okay, a few of you, yeah. And, and, and that doesn't, that's not without reason because uh, for us, as Christians, we talk about Messiah with the definite article, right? The Messiah, and we know who that is. Amen. Jesus. But here's the thing. The term Messiah comes from a Hebrew word, Mashiach. And Mashiach means anointed one. Now, think back to your Old Testament studies from the past. Some of you, you've had these from the time you were kids. Is Jesus the only one to really be considered anointed? No, if, if you read your stories well in the, in the Old Testament, you'll hear about a number of individuals who are anointed. Aaron was one of them, anointed as high priest of God. Another one after the time of Aaron was King Saul. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet to become king. That didn't work out so well in the end. But then Samuel anointed David, and, and he is that golden era king of Israel's past. He was an anointed one. He was a Mashiach just as much as Jesus, whom we call Son of David, just as we call him Son of God, was a Mashiach, an anointed one of God. So anointing was a commonly understood ritual within the context of ancient Israel, and that doesn't mean, however, that every single one of those anointed ones of God panned out so well in the end, Saul being one of those examples. So let's take a look at the context of these chapters Isaiah 9 and Isaiah chapter 11, uh, and see what they have to say about how Messiahship had failed in the days of Isaiah, but how there was hope, that was a great word we heard earlier, there was hope because God had in store for them a better kind of Messiahship. So we begin uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 9, the second half of, of verse 1, because this really begins a new unit of text. It says, at the former time he put to shame, and by he, we're talking here about the Lord himself, Yahweh. He put to shame the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he will have honored the way of the sea, the region across the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep gloom, a light has shone upon them. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people rejoice when they divide the spoil. Okay? Everyone with me on this so far? Okay. Do forgive me if my versification ever gets off. Sometimes the Hebrew text is different in verses, and I don't always remember to make that correction according to the English Bible traditions. But I believe this is what you have in your text, more or less. Now, some of these verses should sound rather familiar. Does anybody recall where we hear some of that language? 
Galilee of the nations, a light shining in the darkness? Sounds like Jesus, Jesus, right? This is quoted at the beginning of of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4. We hear reference to this very language that comes from the text of Isaiah as we read it here. And and that's because Jesus' ministry took place in those northern regions, in those regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, which if you've ever spent time in some of those Sunday morning classes where you you bothered to look at the map of Israel and and the old tribal allotment of lands, you would would know that those those tribes are up there in the north, the, the territory that we also call Galilee. That's where Jesus did his ministry. And so it's very fitting especially considering the context of Jesus' ministry there in Galilee, to see that as, yes, that is a light among the nations. That is a light to people who, no matter what degree they thought they knew light before Jesus' coming, they must have realized it, at least many of them, when they saw it in in his person. Oh, software update. No, thank you. (laughs) Am I right, guys? All right, we'll close that for the time being. And yet what we're talking about in the immediate context of the prophet Isaiah, keeping in mind that this is following this text on the heels of Isaiah chapters 7 and 8, which was about that Syro-Ephraimite war that I I spoke to you about last week. This bitter and troublesome battle uh, that involved the coalition of the Syrians, chiefly from that city of Damascus, and the Ephraimites, or Israelites, of the northern kingdom, making a coalition and fighting against the people of Judah and against their king Ahaz in the city of Jerusalem. And yet in the end, the reassuring message of chapters 7 and 8 that came from God was, do not be troubled about these two armies that are coming your way and besieging your capital because in just a little while, and remember this is what had to do with the child Emmanuel, before that child reaches an age of, let's say, late toddlerhood, That's what's signified by that language of before he eats curds or yogurt and honey. And before he knows to discern good from evil, that's a coming of age kind of language in the Hebrew language. Uh, Before such a time, these two kings will be no threat to you in Jerusalem. And that came about by the culmination of the Syro-Ephraimite War when King Tiglath-Pileser III in the 730s BC swooped down into those territories of Syria and Israel and took care of those threats to his empire. But he also brought his soldiers into the land of Judah as well and by that point Judah had become a vassal to Assyria and so they found themselves heavily taxed in a number of ways. One being very literally by the Assyrian empire but also by having soldiers go through their land and facing the hardship that comes naturally with times of war. But the message of reassurance came back to them again and again in those chapters 7 and 8. God will get you through this, Emmanuel, which means what? God is with us. God is with us. So that was supposed to be a reassuring name, a reassuring phrase to the people of Jerusalem at that time. And shortly thereafter, the Assyrian Empire parceled up those lands of Syria and Israel into official provinces of the Assyrian Empire. They lost some of their their sovereignty, what they had left during that time. And it wouldn't be too many years later, in 722 BC, when the northern kingdom of Israel would be dissolved as an entity. And many of those Israelites would go into exile far beyond even the land of Mesopotamia they would lose out in the end. But the people of Judah would remain for over a century more in their land. And so that was a dark chapter in the history of Israel of the north. And yet that text that we just read coming from the first part of Isaiah 9 says, God has not forgotten even those people in the north. And there will come a time, and you may have noticed some of that language even speaks as if it has happened, when God has shown a light and and when he will have honored those people, and and brought them back into a a better condition. But we continue in the same chapter, starting in verse 4. For the yoke of his burden, meaning Israel's burden, those northern regions, and the staff on his shoulder, the rod of the one oppressing him, you have shattered as the day of Midian. For every sandal trampling in the rush and cloak rolled in blood shall be for burning, fuel for the fire. Now, this is very particular language. 
Some of you may have noticed that we're, we're talking here about implements of warfare, right? Cloaks rolled or dipped in blood, sandals that are trampling in the march or in the rush. This, this is warfare kind of imagery. But it's saying there will come a day when these things will all just be thrown into the fire. You don't need them anymore. It's an end to warfare. Much like language that we've discussed in earlier weeks about beating your swords into plowshares. That also speaks to the same idea. The times of war will eventually come to an end in God's own timing. But at their present state and situation, it was anything but. Isaiah's time was a time of great trouble and lots of warfare. But the promise that comes by way of the prophet is that one day, all of these oppressors will be shattered like that victorious day against the Midianites. And some of you may know where he's going with this. This is language that recalls the victories of Gideon that you read in the book of Judges, starting in Judges 6. Gideon was a warrior, although not one that you would recognize as a warrior when you begin his story, because he seems anything but. But he is qualified as a warrior by Yahweh, who empowers him with his own spirit. And so the last guy you would imagine ends up leading the hosts of Israel for what they are, and they're a ragtag bunch, against all of these Midianites and some of their confederates uh, who are just so numerous, they're like locusts, as the text tells us, on the ground. You know, numerous, innumerable even. Uh, but God gives these petty Israelites the victory on that day. And so this is the promise that comes from Isaiah that, yes, I know times are hard right now, but a day will come when the tide is turned, and it will be as victorious as some of those great stories of our past, when God turned the tables and the underdogs actually won. And that's a very comforting story when you find yourself in the position of the underdog. The text continues in verse 6. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. They shall call his name Marvel, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, or better yet, Ruler of Peace, or Peaceful Ruler. To the increase of the government and to peace there shall be no end. He shall rule upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to firm it up and to support it by justice and by righteousness. Two things that had been lacking in the political situation of Isaiah's own day. That's what Isaiah talked about so much. And from now on to forever, the zeal of Yahweh of armies shall perform this. That's also a very comforting thing given the time. And yet, consider the time. When Isaiah was delivering this oracle, likely right around the same time that he delivered those oracles in chapters 7 and 8 about the syro ephraimite war, meaning in the 730s BC, at that same time he's delivering this message, a son has been born to us. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to mean that in his day he meant a son has already been born. Now, that, that was uh, the, the intended meaning of Emmanuel, that Emmanuel was born in the days of Isaiah. But sometimes prophets will make use of the perfect tense, something that sounds often like it's in the past, to indicate a future event. And when that happens, sometimes the gist of it is to suggest that it's already as good as done. Are you with me on that? You'll see similar language, for example, when the Israelites are about to take possession of the land of Canaan, and God will say to them, look, I have given you this land. Now, technically speaking, he had not, but the idea communicated by the same type of verb in that text, as we find here, might be the assurance of, even though you don't see it yet, it is as good as done, you can trust Yahweh at his word. And yet, imagine how many times in the years of Isaiah, from the latter part of the 8th century up until the coming of Jesus, that people might have looked back at this text and said, is it happening now? Is it in our day? Uh, think about the larger context here, chapters 7, 8, 9, and on, where Isaiah is prophesying during the reign of King Ahaz, not one of Judah's better kings. That's an understatement. But the son of Ahaz, who would take up the throne from him, Hezekiah, was one of Judah's best. The text tells us that he walked in the ways of David, his forefather, and, and there was no one who measured up quite to the standard of Hezekiah. 
Maybe many people at the birth of Hezekiah were saying, maybe this child. Maybe things will start to be set right, even though they already had a Messiah sitting on the throne of David. But as I said before, Judah had had its share of Messiahs over the years, many Messiahs and many of them disappointing. And so that left them with a tension, with some sort of a vacuum of power saying, which king will finally sit on the throne of David and rule justly according to the ways of Yahweh, his God and our God? And that was lacking, certainly, in the days of Ahaz's reign. The text continues in verse 8. The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen against Israel, that all the people may know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, remember that these are just two names for that northern politic of Israel, who say with pride and with inflated mind, the bricks have fallen, but we shall rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores have been chopped down, but we shall put cedars in their place. Yahweh shall elevate the enemies of Rezin against him, and his foes he shall spur on, Aram of the east and the Philistines from the west, and they shall consume Israel with their entire mouth. Despite all this, meaning despite all of that anger of the Lord displayed through the victory of Israel's enemies, his anger is not diverted, and his hand is still outstretched. Now, take a step back for a moment. Notice this boastful language of Israel. And be mindful, this is Israel after they had suffered defeat at the hands of Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria, at the end of that Syro-Ephraimite war. Things had not gone as they planned, and they lost miserably. But here is Israel, personified as one character, saying, well, yes, our bricks have been torn down, our cities destroyed, but... We'll just make better ones, this time not out of bricks, but out of hewn stones. That's that spirit of, of human progress, but it's not seeking that progress according to Yahweh's will. And they say, likewise, the sycamores have been chopped down, and that's because, likely, what's being referenced here is the building of siege works against their cities, where you would, as an invading army, you wouldn't haul logs all the way from your land. You would just take the local trees and build them into whatever you wanted. And that means decimating the local tree populace. But they say, even though the sycamores have been chopped down, we'll, we'll build that up again. We'll, we'll plant, but this time we'll plant cedars, an even more impressive, lofty tree. It kind of sounds like what you hear on the news sometimes. Oklahoma's weather is tough, but its people are tougher. <laughs> And every time I hear that, I think, really? <laughs> God can supply us with strength, to be sure, but it's not going to do any good if I just rage at the storm. <laughs> I'm not tougher than that storm. And, and this is basically that kind of a spirit. Yeah, we'll rebuild. We can do it. And Yahweh says, no, you won't. And so this is a critique, yet again, against Israel that's already suffered one blow of warfare, and, and it's a warning that they're going to suffer yet more from some of their classic enemies, Aram of the East, the Philistines of the West. Whether or not that's meant literally, that's another conversation, but these are understood as two of, enemies classic, or two of Israel's classic enemies anyway. And yet, despite all this, the text tells us, his anger, meaning Yahweh's anger, is not diverted. He still has more to do to punish Israel. Wow. That would be like one bad thing coming your way, and then another, and one day, and again, and again. You suffer in so many ways, and you say, am I done, Lord? <laughs> what, what more can I bear? And, and the Lord says, you are not done. And his hand is still outstretched. Not outstretched in this way, as a kind gesture, but outstretched with a fist. That, that is implied clear enough. What's so striking about that imagery is that the audience of Isaiah might very well recall that the language of Israel's exodus talks about God's arm outstretched against Egypt. So when they thought about God's hand and the powers that come from God's hand or his arm outstretched, they would likely recall how God had outstretched his arm or his hand in the past against Israel's enemies, but now he's outstretching it against his own people. And that has some shock value. Prince of Egypt. I love it. It's a great movie. Not exactly following the text, 
but, <laughs> but uh, it recalls through its imagery just how devastating some of these plagues of God must have been upon Egyptian society in, in the artist's rendering. But to imagine that God would, in this kind of way, plague his own people shows you how desperate times had become. The text continues in verse 13. The people have not returned to the one who struck them, and Yahweh of armies they have not sought. So Yahweh will cut off from Israel the head and the tail, the branch and the rush in one day, the elder and the elevated of presence, that is, the head, the prophet and the false teacher, that is, the tail. In other words, he's cutting off every last bit of, of their societal structure. Everything that holds them together, Yahweh is about to level. And we can say that, that quite literally this will happen, especially in the year 722 when Israel is exiled from their land. Those who lead his pe this people are those who lead them astray, and those who are led are swallowed up. For this reason, the Lord does not rejoice over their young men. There are other passages in, in the Bible that talk about the Lord rejoicing over the young men of one of his cities or of his people. And, and sometimes that has a connotation of them even going out into war and he is with their armies, but not this time. I will not rejoice with your men is, is the message here from God. And their orphans and widows, he does not show compassion. That has even more bite to it. Because if you read your Torah well, and if, as, as our brother Dayton encouraged us tonight, if you look for the treasures of God and, and these, these powerful wonders of his teachings, of his instruction, you will know that it matters so much to God how his people take care of those two groups especially, the widows and the orphans. So for the prophet to say Yahweh will not even show compassion to the widows and orphans tells you this is a society that is corrupt from the top down. This is a truly horrendous situation that cannot be remedied, it seems. For all of them, as the text goes on to explain, and this would include those lower classes that God tends to look after, all of them are impious and evildoers, and every mouth speaks foolishness. Despite all this, meaning despite more of his punishment on them, his anger is not diverted, and his hand is still outstretched. Are you seeing a theme here? This is a series now. We're getting into a new part of Isaiah's rhetoric where time and again he will list a new devastation coming from God as well as categorizing the sins of the people of Israel. And each time he will cap it off with despite all this, meaning despite the laundry list of God's punishments, we're still not done. And God's hand is still outstretched like the plagues of Egypt, right? How many does it take to get the point? Did I see a hand? Yeah. That's right. That's right. You know, that, that's a good passage to read together with this one. Proverbs 1, 7, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or, or wisdom. Uh, and that's a lesson that could speak so well to this situation. Here is Israel not learning that very important lesson. They're experiencing all sorts of suffering in their lives. That's clear enough from the passage. They've already lost one war against Assyria. And, and now more is coming, and yet they won't get it. They won't learn that lesson that fear properly placed in the Lord, in Yahweh, might, might alleviate some of this for them. Yeah, that's a great, a great point, Billy. And then the text tells us, starting in verse 18, Indeed, wickedness burns like a fire, consuming thorn and thistle. It kindles the thickets of the forest, and they are turned into a column of smoke. At the wrath of Yahweh of armies, the land is scorched. And the people, I put that in quotation, or in, uh, with a question mark, because some of the texts of Isaiah is not exactly uh, very clear. And the people become fuel for the fire. They do not show pity on each other. One snatches on the right and is hungry. Another eats on the left and is not sated. Each one eats the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh eats Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. Together, they are against Judah. Everybody's turned against one another. And these are 
these are groups that used to be family, right? These are the tribes that are traced back to that lineage of the patriarchs, and yet now they're at each other's throats. That's the message here. Despite all this, his anger is not diverted and his hand is still outstretched. Such a sad image. I don't want to end on this sad image. <laughs> I want to jump ahead, if, if you'll join me, past some more of these oracles of woe and more of that repeated phrase, despite all this, his anger is not diverted, his arm is still outstretched. And let's get to the eventual resolution. After a repetition of some of these phrases, Isaiah 10.33 says, Look, the Lord, Yahweh of armies, is going to lop off boughs with a terrible crash. Don't worry, the high point's coming. <laughs> All right, but still, there's a little more judgment to go first. The lofty in stature are going to be cut down, and the haughty shall be brought low, and he shall strike the thickets of the forest with iron. And by the way, some of the preceding verses in this chapter tell us that his instrument, his iron instrument for chopping off these so-called lofty trees, these boughs, which really stand for world leaders, that axe is Assyria. Okay? And he has a plan for that axe. The axe is not off the hook. But for the time being, that is his weapon. And so he chops down uh, through this forest, and Lebanon, we are told, shall fall along with the mighty one. Now, Lebanon, that's certainly a country in their day, just as it is in ours, but this is not just in reference to this, the country of Lebanon. Lebanon, because of its tall cedars, those famous cedars of Lebanon, becomes a metaphor for any number of these prideful kings of the earth that would set themselves up against Yahweh, including some of God's own kings of Israel and Judah who have not walked in the ways of their God, Yahweh. And then, on the heels of so much destruction, so much woe and gloom where things might seem hopeless, and after so, so much chopping down of lofty trees, which means these rulers, there's this ray of hope in the next chapter. But a twig shall emerge from the stem of Jesse, and a shoot shall spring up from his roots. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and discernment, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. Fear of Yahweh, right, Billy? Just like you said a moment ago. This will inform his career. And he shall savor the fear of Yahweh. It's, it's in the sense that he will smell, he will enjoy fear of Yahweh. You ever, ever imagine you could enjoy fear? <laughs> but fear properly placed in the holy God is one that can be mixed in emotion. Yes, fear, it can make us sh shake and shiver, but in a good way. Good shivers, you might say. And, and so this, he will actually enjoy that respect, that fear of Yahweh's person. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, nor shall he render decision based on what his ears hear. How many of us are limited, even though our eyes and our ears are vessels by which we can discern the stimuli of our world? But there is a, a greater level of discernment, isn't there? I don't think I even need to explain that to you all. And so this king will have that sixth sense to, to judge better than any of us. He will deliver, and the word here, by the way, in the Hebrew can mean judge in a negative connotation in other texts, but when the object of the word is the poor, then it actually means that you deliver them. You're not going to judge somebody who's already in the down and outs. You're going to deliver such a person from his or her oppressors. And so he shall deliver the poor with justice and render decision for the afflicted of the land with right. He shall strike the land by the rod of his mouth, and by the breath of his lips he shall put the wicked to death. Justice shall be the belt about his waist, and faithfulness the belt about his loins. So many ancient kings made a name for themselves uh, by how they dressed, impressing the people with their royal garments, and, and including how they dressed for warfare, the, the kind of belts that they wore, things that would look impressive and put awe on the people. But for this king, what matters most that he adorns himself with are God's ways. Once again, the marvelous mysteries of God's Torah that are there to be searched out. Faithfulness, justice, these things that matter to God will be so close to him, they'll be like his clothing. And for such a long time, for so many centuries, beginning with Isaiah's message here, the people of Judah were left reeling, looking for this kind of a hope and expecting it, and perhaps even seeing some fulfillment of it in the occasional king like Hezekiah and Josiah, 
But no king, no Messiah would better fit those shoes than Jesus. The one that we call the Messiah. Not because there were no other Messiahs in history, but because nobody better deserves that title. Even King David himself. Jesus, the son of David, even more so the son of God, is that Messiah. He, he has fulfilled so many uh, of those hopes. He has set right so many of those things that were broken for Israel and Judah in the past. And by doing so, he also reinvented what it is to be a leader, didn't he? Most kings of the world, they say, yes, I am great, you're right, <laughs> and, and give me my due service. But what did he do? He came not to be served, but to serve. And so as we conclude this message of the prophets, on a high note, right, I, I promised you I'd get there. Uh, let's consider the revolutionary, revolutionary ways of Jesus our Lord and the way that he took Messiahship to the next level. Right? The, the way that he challenges us in his leadership in, in ways that should promote further speculation in, in our current context, politically speaking, as well as religiously, as well as emotionally, as well as intellectually, about what we're currently doing and how God may need to stretch us still. And if we, if we listen rightly to the gospel message and we learn who this Messiah is, we can continue to be stretched by that prophetic message. Ooh, that's a good picture to end on. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Greg. Yeah.